Blog Talk Radio. It's time for the birth of the new golden era. Welcome to Shattering the Matrix. Your host, Ari Kopel, and co-host, Serena, bring you information that will shatter the matrix and shine light on the conditions and forces that are keeping the planet in third dimensional density and inspire solutions and positive outcomes. Humanity needs to step up and desire to be freed from the darkness of this prison. No one, no thing outside of ourselves will do this for us. Ari Kopel helps us step into our power and authority that will shatter this prison. Now, be prepared to open up your consciousness, become aware, and emerge victorious by standing in our divine power and divine authority in unison, co-creating a new earth. Now, here's your host of Shattering the Matrix, Ari Kopel, and co-host Serena. Hi, this is Ari and Serena your show host for Shattering the Matrix. Today we have an amazing guest, uh, someone that's extremely sought after uh, from her uh, groundbreaking work uh, in the field of uh, anomalous trauma and uh, experiences with uh, abductions. Uh, And even beyond that, we're talking about the forces that are right now uh, ruling, controlling this planet, keeping it hostage. Uh, we have an amazing guest, and her name is Eve Lorgan. And uh, Eve, I'm going to talk a little bit about your biography here. Uh, Eve Lorgan is an author, uh, hypnotherapist with 20 years of research in anomalous uh, trauma uh, in, into what is called the alien abductions with uh, mill labs, uh, mind control survivors, and paranormal experiencers. Uh, she began her pioneering work while earning her master's degree in counseling psychology in 1990. She also holds a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry and worked in the biotechnology industry for seven years. Eve started a support group back in 1994 in San Diego County, California for experiencers of anomalous trauma and continues to consult with anomalous trauma clients worldwide today while living in Western North Carolina. She was also a close associate of the late Barbara Bartholik and was also inspired by Dr. Carla Turner. Uh, Eve is also a yogi, which is absolutely fantastic. I didn't know that until today. And uh, Eve has authored uh, two amazing books, The Love Bite, Alien Interference of Human Love uh, Relationships. And she's also uh, authored The Dark Side of Cupid, Love Affairs, the Supernatural, and Energy Vampirism. Uh, So these are available in uh, Amazon.com and uh, definitely, definitely worth getting. Uh, Eve, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Fantastic. And, uh, Eve, we have a long, t- a really good, well, it's a jam-packed two-hour session here today. So much information that we need to get across to, to our listeners. Uh, and, Serena, are you with us? I don't know if Serena just got Yes, off. I am. I'm sorry. I had to unmute because <laughs> I wanted to make sure I didn't cause any noise here in the background. Yes, I am here. Fantastic. Okay. okay. Well, you know, Eve um, and, and Serena and I, we both, we all actually had a, a talk, of, was it a couple of days ago, and we just delved into a lot of really unexplored territory um, and, um, well, mostly unexplored uh I, I guess a lot of people are really not uh, aware uh, of this particular aspect of uh, your research, perhaps, Eve. So we were talking um, about spiritual communities uh, being targeted by these negative forces right now that are on the planet. Um, and I know that you have some experience with this or you wanted to address this. Did you want to talk about that? Oh, sure. That's actually a good point, and it's kind of really an extension of what I have observed over the years uh, when I started working with people who've had different forms of anomalous trauma specifically related to the mind control issue, alien abductions, what I call MILABs, uh, ritual abuse, narcissistic abuse, or the more when there's paranormal interference. 
but not always. But uh, one of the things that I noticed was what I call the interference and disruption factor that manifests like spiritual warfare against the person who is awakening or trying to break programming or be more involved in their healing and recovery process to become more aware and more spiritually connected to the divine, if that's a way to put it. And this really goes beyond what the psychologist would normally say is your own transference issues and your own defense issues, although that's part of it in, in anybody's personal life. But this goes way beyond um, simple explanations of coincidence and you know self-projection and defenses and that kind of thing. So I, I noticed it personally in people's lives when I started doing support groups with people who've had alien abductions and milabs or ritual abuse or some of the more unusual traumas, even narcissistic abuse, which is starting to become much more popular as a, as a topic on forums. And the whole concept of the narcissist, the predator, the psychopath personality type or the narcissistic personality disorder, um, these kinds of individuals wreak havoc in relationships and cause great, great damage yes. in relationships. Yes. So much so that it is almost incomprehensible. If you've never encountered having to deal with a narcissist in an interpersonal relationship, you have no idea. Well, just add add several dimensions to that and then you get what I talk about in the dark side of Cupid and some of the alien love bite scenarios. Because what we're dealing with, at least in some of those uh, cases, especially in the dark side of Cupid, are the predator, narcissist, psychopaths who have what I call the overshadowed entity or they're being parasited by some kind of non-human entity or force that causes them to behave in a very predatory and vampiristic fashion. So having said that, um, one of the things that has come across my lap more recently is the is people who are involved, let's say, in spiritual light worker groups or light workers or healers who are very talented. Uh, many of them are women, and they come to discover that their spiritual community or they personally have been targeted by, let's say, dark forces that manifest through certain types of people. And I'll just call these people wolves in sheep's clothing who will infiltrate spiritual communities or even organizations or whatever. Um, they could contact you through a love relationship, for example, let's say online dating, um, where it's the predator psychopath, but it's more of what I call the, the hosted, uh, the host, the reptilian host or the archontic, uh, completely taken over kind of personality that will interact and wreak extreme havoc in relationships and spiritual communities. So I had a case like that that I'm getting ready to, to write about. I've already interviewed some people that actually were in the east, southeastern United States who had a spiritual community and put out a, a letter for uh, in a local newspaper kind of thing, um, you know, wanting members to get involved with, uh, let's say, community building uh, on issues like organic gardening, sustainable living, spirituality issues, clean food, just community connecting for people who are spiritually minded and wanting to raise their awareness and raise the awareness in their communities. So this was obviously a prime target for a particular um, wolf in sheep's clothing that um, got in contact with a woman in this group that she started and started sharing um, their ideas on, on healing, like hands-on healing or Reiki healing and the topic of UFOs and extraterrestrials and, you know, what's visiting this planet and what's the government involved in and a lot of, you know, the popular conspiracy issues that are out there. And so the person came off as being... Um, you know, not necessarily bad, he was pleasant and he wasn't belligerent or anything and seemed to know a lot about healing and seemed to definitely have, you know, remote viewing capabilities and psychic capabilities and knew how to do, you know, spirituality based exercises, mostly kind of new age related. But as time went on and of course I'll, I'll have this story out hopefully by the end of the week on my website, um, as time went on more red flags arose concerning this particular man. It was a man in this case. And he, when he did, let's say, healings, when he was doing a healing over someone, he would, you know, do the hands over healing and appear to maybe go into a trance. And then during the trance, he'd kind of go through this emotional state where 
um, he would ask for this benign walk-in entity to come in him and you know assist in the healing process. And so basically he admitted to having uh, what he called several ET walk-in guides, each from maybe a different planet or dimension that had maybe different personalities or characteristics. So as time went on, obviously the people knew that he had more than just his quote host personality. He had, you know, at least four different entities within him working through him to carry out their particular teaching and metaphysical guru kind of actions. But uh, one of the things that the person did notice was uh, a psychic linking in with her. Uh, where it was, I think there was a little bit of a romantic attraction and interest on his part towards her. Um, and, you know, then she started feeling, um, you know, the psychic linking in, like he was spying on her. And indeed, he was able to prove that he was able to do that. Like when he was on the phone, he'd be able to just describe things in her home and what she was doing or maybe what was going on in her life. Like he was tuning in psychically pretty accurately. And so he did have these abilities, no doubt. So um, she also started to feel the, the sexual energy manipulations that would take place, um, you know, physical sexual manipulation of energy, which this is something that's been reported to me privately by people who are involved with, like, the alien love bite or when they're involved with a partner that they think there's an entity attached or there's they're some kind of black magician or something. So those things were reported. And, and then, uh, boy, the story was... It was amazing because it involved so many elements that are really uh, popular in our contemporary alternative media and conspiracy circles. Yeah. You know, the, the talk of, you know, the different ETs and, you know, the benevolent ones, and then there's the bad ones, and then how the government are involved with uh, communicating with ETs and using ET technology and recovering their craft. And, like, one of the stories that the, the man gave the woman who reported to me was that he had this ability that the military were able to find out i guess when he was younger he was in the regular military i don't know if it was the army i don't know which ex ex exact branch but they i guess through testing they are, were able to assess that he had an extraordinary psychic and intuitive ability so he was sheep dipped into another more i guess black op type of program where he was trained more fully and then used more for um, remote viewing and reconnaissance with remote viewing and psychic skills as well as um, being able to decipher alien symbols and hieroglyphic uh, sigils whatever they were wow. I guess he his ET walk-ins actually had those abilities so um, I think what's happening is that there's certain people who are working in these black op programs that if they have these ET walk-ins or whatever they they have these extra abilities and knowledge that you know that a regular human doesn't have so right. that's one reason why the military would use them as as an agent right so right. as the story went on you know they discovered that he was kind of acting more like a con artist and seemed to want to get the her and her son actually involved in opening themselves up for what he called is, and this is all designed in the whole ET paradigm uh, language, like saying that, oh, well, you know, he has a, a star being uh, body on a craft in another dimension. That's like your other self. And, uh, and then try to get you to fuse and meld with that star body. And, and this actually was turning into getting the person ready for possession. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause for a moment. Um, to wow. see if there's, there's anything that you wanted to say because I, I think that you might have had a question about yeah. something. Yeah, um, yeah. The the situation with the the spiritual communities that are trying to form um, there there is, for example, a widespread movement of, um, of these communities that want to like form small communities and and have organic food and be more spiritually minded and closer to the earth and live in peace you know everything that you stated in the beginning there are a lot of them i am i'm in fact what part of a um a website that lists them all over the world and one of the most popular ways of doing this is through the anastasia series of books which i think you're familiar with right yes yeah 
they talk about these communities, and Anastasia describes how they can be how can how they can be created. Well, a lot of us have tried to create those communities, and even in Russia, where they said uh, a million, I think a million uh, residents were given land by the government there. The um, I forget what they call the government there, but a million uh, people were given plots of land to work on, on themselves, and to form these communities. And there have not been any successful communities. And if you, can, if you, if you continue to monitor these, these spiritual communities that are trying to form, there is always one person, just one person that it takes to destroy the community that was doing well or to cause something to prevent it from even getting off, you know, off, the, off the floor. But these, uh, these communities are definitely sabotaged. Um, I'm seeing it, and it's not, as, uh, it's not as rare as people think. It, there, it's, not as, it's not the exception to the rule. It is the rule that the sabotage is taking place. The exception is that these communities are successful. Uh, they're very few in number. And as for the, um, the attractive, you know, and charismatic psychopath, well, I, I had one for 20 years. <laughs> I had one for 20 years, and I had no idea um, what was going on. I, I, I was told that I carried the relationship. I carried the relationship. Um, because everything that was contributed, all the emotion, all of the caring, all of the... Everything that went on in the relationship was something that I had done or contributed or said, you know, needs to happen or whatever. And when I was quiet, nothing happened. I mean, there was this guy did not do anything, and I didn't realize that because, as a woman, I am very talented, and I think most women are great multitaskers, and we we tend to think in circles, and we, you know, as as opposed to just the left side of the brain, we go back and forth on a regular basis. Um, and so I didn't realize that he was not carrying anything. And, you know, he had done some really, <laughs> you can't be human and, and think that there's nothing wrong with these things. Um, but he, to this day, thinks that there was nothing wrong with what he did. And getting over this kind of relationship, it, it has taken me 10 years to get over this. And I was one of the toughest people I ever knew. I was one of the toughest people my friends and family ever knew. As far as relationships and, and um, things like that go, I'm I'm like one of the toughest, most liberated people they know. But this this guy totally threw me for a loop, and you really never see them coming. And my point is, I think this is also the most common thing. I think it is more the rule rather than the, the uh, exception. I think it happens far more often, and we need to just like this alien thing that that term used to turn me off because I I would say well I'm not part of this alien UFO thing and I don't want to think about it but if you remove that terminology and the the stigma and stereotyping that it has behind it and take everything else then a lot of women would find more relation uh, more um, how do you say resonance with what's happening because they are there are a lot of women that are having this experience you know if you take the alien word out of it the experience is extremely common, and this is what I wanted to say: is I I, I don't want uh, people to think that these are rare cases that we're talking about. We're talking about them because they're very very common. Okay, and I see Ari wants to say something. Yeah. Can you hear Ari? me? Can you hear me, guys or girls? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Just wanted to you know just um, uh, follow with what Eve was saying. Um, and, and basically question, um, is there any um, insight, and, and, and I know, I'm just bringing this up so we can bring it up into conversation, is there any, any insight as to why this is happening? Why are the spiritual communities being um, infiltrated this way, uh, and many of them with either gurus, or uh, certain belief systems or whatever with, with information that it keeps us in, you know, in a certain level and perhaps looking away, perhaps not, not addressing these forces. I mean, have you figured out what that might be, uh, Eve? Have you kind of thought, given that some thought? Well, you know, um, it's a very good question because it seems as though 
this is definitely happening. It's very real, and it happens to many more than we can imagine. So it's common. Um, of course, the alien notation is probably a turnoff for a lot of people because there's there's a programming. I think there's a programming in and of itself to avoid the UFO alien ET issue unless it's perceived in a certain way that's according to an agenda. But the the predatory influence has been with humanity for a very long time. Yeah. Although now I think it has stepped up a notch because we're at the what they call towards the end of the Kali Yuga and kind of playing out the, the end part of this myth, which I'm starting to really look into more of the, the Gnostic Sophia Gaia myth that John Lash really is, is the expert about. And one of the things that he, he kept reiterating in many of his interviews was the fact that the Sophianic myth and all that which is contained in that myth, mostly that's derived from the tractates in the Nag Hammadi library, that it's the one myth that has basically been kept secret and that it's different and unique from many of the other creation and other religious spiritual myths. But the one thing that does stand out as true, and one of the reasons why I really loved the Nag Hammadi Library and it made so much sense to me, it was like it, the bells rang off for me, um, and it was when they started talking about the rulers and the authorities and the archons and Yalta Beoth and how they intrude in our mind and how they try to take us over and their, how they behave and how to protect against them that this was a really, really big issue with the people who were more enlightened and aware because they were, they were connecting with um, what they call the divine organic light right. and connecting with the divine nature and using those paranormal capabilities to really become aware, to perceive what's really happening on all these subtle levels of reality. And this is what shamans and many indigenous and other cultures have done for, for years. Right. That when you can start perceiving this, you ob obviously can perceive at some level that there are, there's an interaction between predatory aspects and, and then the natural human being and our own natural spiritual nature. So there's, there's like a war going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as long as we're in this human form in a dualistic world, I think it will continue to, to appear that way. So I think that we do need to address it and we know that it is real, at least from our perspective. And it seems to me that there's religious and especially new age systems that will deny this or only place it in a certain framework that reinforces their own religious singular belief system, which is really part of the mind control programming. So there's. <laughs> Wow. It's really hard to um, get this really clear without falling into religious ideologies that it's like out of the frying pan and into the fire back into the mind control systems which are enslaving us. Yeah. So, um, hmm. yeah. So, so just learning how to deal with this has been a lot of my work, learning how to understand it and recognize it and then learning how to deal with it effectively without falling back into religious ideologies which are part of the corruptions, you know? Absolutely. And um, just wanted to, you know, bring up the fact that uh, many times um, a lot of the spiritual communities and the members uh, within those communities um, are taken pretty much for a ride in, in the, in, with respect to uh, the information. Is it that they are not discerning? Um, and what is keeping them from being discerning? That's a really good question because for me in my personal life, discernment meant personal experience of having to deal with these forces and so awareness is certainly the, num the number one factor that to help us defend against is awareness and expanding one's awareness and when you do that sometimes you have to let go of beliefs that keep you believing that oh it must be this oh it must be that or it must be nothing um, just letting go of beliefs while expanding your awareness just to perceive what's present and, and be able to see the interaction of energies and people and di relationship dynamics, which by the way, uh, something that we had discussed in private is it tends to be a more feminine, intuitive yep. uh, type of uh, ability. Mm -hmm. Women are more intuitive when it comes to psychic perceptions and relationship dynamics. And that's something that's natural for us. We, we call it women's intuition, mm -hmm. uh, female wisdom. 
Right. And interesting enough, that is the one thing that I think actually is the solution to what we're dealing with because we're the ones who really wake up to it and tend to be the victims of this, especially in, in like controlling relationships with the predator type of narcissist partner. Although I will say that there's people that I've worked with where men get dealt with the women who were the, the obvious controlling manipulative narcissist type. It's not limited to men. But I think part of the solution is tapping into that divine wisdom and intuitive aspect of what we call the right brain aspect of being, as well as a, a balance of the rational mind. And, and then using those intuitions to really uh, basically nip it in the bud before it becomes a problem. Right. Well, this is, this is why the Dalai Lama himself has been quoted as saying that this world will be saved by the Western woman. Right? He, he understands that it's women that have to step up to the plate because obviously since the beginning of human history, um, the patriarchy has existed to suppress the feminine. I mean, that's what patriarchy means. It's, it's all about suppressing. So there has to be a reason why this has taken place and why it has existed for hundreds of thousands of years, if not longer. Um, there is a power that is inherent within the feminine itself that they either or both fear and hate. I think, I think it is actually both. They, they both, they fear it and hate it, obviously, because that's the only time you need to repress anything is when you have a fear of it, right? Because if you're, if you're all powerful, you don't need to suppress anything because you're all powerful. So there's, there's no need to suppress anything. So obviously there is a fear there. And the fear has existed for hundreds of thousands of years or, or, or more. And the, the patriarchy um, has in their left brain in rational ways um, served the agenda of destruction. Absolutely. I agree. It's, uh, it's easier to manipulate a left brain dominant thinker obviously in mind control, and this is an established fact, by the way, I mean, people who, who know about mind control and MKUltra, for example, know that it's easier to program males than females or those who are primarily left-brained. Yes. As, uh, treating it like a computer, more on that level, is easier to manipulate. Whereas somebody who has that um, divine connection and it's not always logical, it's harder to manipulate and control. Logic is very overrated. Logic has its own built-in limitations. I don't know why they put it on a pedestal. It, it is very, it's, it's a very shallow. Um, yeah, it's part of the, the value system of the dominator system. And this is why you don't hear a lot of really uh, important big radio show hosts talking about these issues in this way. It's because there's an assumed uh, belief that that which is logical, rational, and scientific according to the patriarchal value systems, that that's more important. It's, it's a subconsciously ingrained belief that that's just more important, just has more value. So there's a lot of people, I think, who have answers, who are dealing with this, who are intuitive, and they know, like a lot of women just know this intuitively, but you don't hear them on the big coast-to-coast -coast shows. You don't really hear this being accepted. <laughs> Uh, and it's, it's really frustrating. I mean, I, I see that there's a lot of really important things on the air and people saying things that they're almost always men. Right. <laughs> and I think, you know, women are overburdened in this society in terms of the working woman with children, how they possibly even have time and energy to even do things, you know. It's, um, it's hard. It's hard to do it all. And we're left to be, it's almost like the, the Sophionic myth. It's like she's the eternal widow the eternal single woman having to do it all alone. Right. Under the, under the impact of these predators and narcissists and psychopaths. And it, it seems like women are living that reality today in, in the patriarchy society where, you know, we're expected to do a full-time job like a man and then do everything like a woman, then expected to actually have enough energy to even function. But the trouble with that is it's hard to access your divine feminine nature when you're so overwhelmed with uh, survival and functioning in the, I guess, the left brain to do the right. job and then being overwhelmed with all the family work because it's still not divided equally in most 
couples, in most family situations, you know. I mean, exactly. some, some women have better, you know, better relationships that way. But I found that to be really difficult, that the more that I had to focus on, let's say, being a scientist and doing my job and being busy and, you know, having to keep a list and doing this, 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 multitasking, then I wasn't able to relax to tap into my divine feminine nature, which was naturally intuitive, naturally joyful, naturally wanting to care and nurture and just uh, a happier, more joyful existence. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly it. With, with the devaluation of the essence of your being. And it's, it's something that is that what I think oppressed cultures feel, like, you know, black people, let's say, or people in other countries where their race has been oppressed. And it's something that you feel intuitively on a subconscious level that there's this assumed devaluation of who you are because of your gender. And if you feel it, even though they don't state it overtly, but you see it in the evaluation of of how things are valued in the world. Yes. And you might have some comments on that. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> yes, I, always, I will always, go ahead. always. Go ahead, comments. Serena. Go ahead, Just Serena. On that. Eve, that was so well said. I hope people uh, pay attention to that and replay it and listen to it over and over again because that's exactly what it is now. This this other aspect that you talked about, your your free and liberated and joyful side that was your natural beingness as a woman, right? This planet does not know what a real woman uh, uh, paradigm, feminine paradigm looks like. This world does not know what, what that looks like. This entire planet does not have a clue. Yeah. Um, we have not seen it or experienced it yet. Well, not for a very, very long time. But the way you described it as being happy and free, joyful, spontaneous, intuitive in the moment, this is natural. This is the natural life. This is why the archontic or alien or patriarchal, whatever term you choose to use, take your pick. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. Has created this matrix that deliberately keeps the woman busy, barefoot and pregnant, if you will, or working nine to five, or, or locked down within educational systems which force you into left brain domination. The entire system, everything that we see on this planet is devised to keep you away from your spirituality, including their religions, every single one. And so when a woman is taken outside of her nature and forced to be this other thing that is left brain dominant within a, a tiny spectrum of reality, this tiny paradigm of the left brain, which is literally only 4% of the world, which is the only reality that they recognize is this, this left brain dominator group, right? It's the world of physicality. It's 4% of reality. 96% of it is invisible. And this also comprises our reality. And these are parts, uh, part of what con constitutes uh, part of that is the imagination realm, the, the, the dream time realm, um, the spiritual realms, and all of these invisible places, the astral realms, and all of these other places. This is 96% of reality. It's very, it, it is very real. It's just not seen. But the left brain dominator types will only stick to the 4%. And this is what we're locked down in. And this is why women are so miserable because they're, they're, they're confined into this tiny box that men have confined themselves in and are, seem to be happy in, in this 4% little box on the left side there. And it's just, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible what I see happening on the planet because not only is she confined into being forced to being this in, in every country you can imagine, even if it's, it's a civilized European country, all the way to the uh, Asian countries and these patriarchal religions, the women are suffering. The women are suffering. And this has always been on the planet. Now, why is that? This is something that has been created and it has kept alive by force and by aggression, by ridicule, um, and by every other means you can imagine. And it's completely unnatural. It's alien. It is alien. It is not the natural way. Definitely. And, um, Ari, you wanted to say something? Well, I just wanted to bring it back to, um, uh, you know, the these archontic forces and whatnot, uh, these, these evil uh, forces that are on the planet, um, because I've noticed that a lot of the uh, 
there's a lot of disinformation being propagated out there. Uh, again, bringing it back to the uh, communities that we're talking about, the spiritual communities. Uh, because I find that that is like really, really, that, that's like to me very important because uh, these are the ones that are supposed to, um, you know, uphold everything that is good on this planet, uh, everything that's wholesome. And if we're being compromised, uh, we really won't have a shot in hell <laughs> to, you know, to recuperate. So, so that's why, you know, I'm addressing this. Um, I find that a lot of the, for example, gurus, um, so-called, uh, a lot of the leaders that are this, in the spiritual communities, not not a lot, you know, like the majority, but a, a good a good portion of them, and a channel uh, channeled information. Those, those supposedly the the beings are being channeled. They all tend to be male. Have you noticed that, or is it just my imagination? <laughs> well, the, a lot of the channelers are females, like. More females are psychic and able to channel, mm -hmm. but a lot of the entities do seem to be male or some famous past life kind of entity. But um, it's a lot of common themes that come up over and over again with channeled information, and certainly not all of them are the same. But there's there's something to it that you certainly have to to look at that with a critical eye. You know, by their by their fruit you shall know them, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and and one of the things why I'm doing this article that I'm going to put out at the end of the weekend in my book is to show and what is the signature of these deceivers and how can you tell if they're malevolent and uh, instead of you know naming them according to race, gender, creed, religion or like this ET or that ET or this group or that group it's really the energetic signature of what is presenting itself and how they're interacting with you yeah. that's what's important Absolutely. and if they're basically an energy vampire and they're controlling and manipulating and using deception to get you to do things like uh, become hosts for other entities or to get you to uh, manipulate others energy while you're really psychically vampiring them or to get you to invoke and bring more of those entities into the world by opening up portals. That's what they're trying to do, mm -hmm. to get more and more of these entities yeah. into the world. So that was the definite red flag in the, in the case that I was working on, that they were using all this uh, you know, ET paradigm terminology to basically possess and um, invoke more and more of these self-same entities into the world. So because they want to feed off of us and they that's what they do and I think they are jealous that they do not have something that we have right. which may be related to the soul or the luminous epinoia or whatever um, that the Gnostics I guess were able to identify what that was so yeah you can tell basically but the deception is so good I mean these beings these predator psychopaths and these either these hosted ones, I mean, they're really good at hiding what they are so that they're able to be charismatic and you won't notice it, okay? Because they work by deception and predation, they are good at what they do. So an ordinary person who doesn't know that they exist, they're not going to pick up on it unless you're already psychic and you've already dealt with this before, basically. Wow. Right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Eve, if I may, I, th I think that um, if I may speak for Ari, I think when Ari mentioned that all the channels uh, about the channeling material being mostly male yes it is women that are channeling because they are naturally intuitive and psychic we we know this and they are the ones channeling however the beings that they're channeling are male i think i think that is what ari wanted to say yeah. you know is yeah. that what yeah. you meant that, that yeah is because correct. this is this is a point that we have talked about um at length before and we have gone through the list of the uh, channels, materials that are being put out there and who is doing the channeling and who is the being that is being channeled. And nine times out of ten, yes, it's women who are doing the channeling. They are open and susceptible to receiving uh, other, you know, sensing other entities and energies. But it's the males that are coming in with the quote unquote information, the channeled material that are male. Every once in a while you hear something about Mother Mary or something, but that's, that's so rare. If you look at all the other stuff, it's, it's the male. And um, anyway, that is the point that I wanted to just make clear. We've, we've observed that. We've watched that. Yeah, there's some male, there's some men that are also doing the channeling. You know, they're bringing in the, uh, 
uh, you know, the, what is his name, Tom Kenyon, uh, he brings in, uh, who does he bring the in? Hathors. The Hathors. The Hathors. Uh, Bashar. Bashar, you know, there's another one that brings in the Akash and the Sun. Uh, cry on, there's cry on, on. yeah. There's, these are these are groups, and then there's there and then there's uh, Esther Hicks, and uh, she's bringing in the Abraham, those guys, right. you know, the Abraham group, whatever the hell they are. Right, right. So yeah, it's very very interesting, and they do all, and you're you're right, spot on with that. They do all have a, a, a an energetic signature to them. And they have a certain pattern of you know of, of the way the message comes across and and the way it's presented and 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 the, the kind of stuff that's in there and uh, and most of it you know you can you can almost you know decipher the pattern. Dear uh, heart. Yeah, that's one of them. It's like the, it, yes, yes. It, oh, oh, dear beloved ones, we love you so much. Right. It's always the same. Yeah. It's usually the same thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to definitely address that because that seems to be almost like an epidemic. A lot of the spiritual community, at least the, the ones that are, uh, you know, that should be in the know uh, with, with connecting, you know, directly to uh, e what, what we call God or source or whatever, are really using these tools to, to get information that really they should uh, be getting directly. Um, so that they're being hijacked. Yeah, that's a good word for it, hijacking. Yeah. It, it seems to be they're, they're co-opting our connection and then using our soul energy to insert their own message instead of us being able to connect directly to what we really are in our true nature. Right. And I think that's, that's what means tapping into our own power and learning what that is. And once you recognize it and connect with that, then you won't be as easily disrupted. However, I mean, I know people who are really um, on the ball, or they seem to be on the ball spiritually in terms of connectedness and doing a lot of good work, and then they're targeted by one of these um, predator personality types. Yep. Um, and then they have a particular agenda, and some of them do have entities within them that are controlling the individual to disrupt that person's life. And in this particular case I'm working on, he actually worked for the shadow government and the shadow government apparently is very much involved with the occultic aspects of ETs and ET walk-ins and the technology that they can have and and you know making bargains with these entities without realizing you know what it, it appeared that there must be many in these black op programs including the ones in charge who are completely taken over by these forces completely taken over wow so in terms of a of a solution. I mean, we really have to learn how to deal with that in our own private lives so that it doesn't get the best of us, being able to identify it before it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And can they, uh, can people pick this up, like in one of your books, are you addressing that? Oh yes, and in The Dark Side of Cupid I'm talking more about specifically the healing process and, you know, recognition, resolution, and proactive ways to deal with you know, when you have one of these dark side of Cupid relationships, that you can apply that to uh, communities where if you want to start building communities, you must be aware and know how to deal with this and nip it in the bud before this person can and ruin an entire organization or family. They'll try to pit one against the other until they, you know, become the, the top dog and start changing things. And it's, it's amazing the kind of reports I get constantly. I mean, a lot. Wow. Yeah. This is this is something that I also wanted to make a point about is how is is how common that is is um, this is this is the matrix right this matrix is this whole alien what I'm calling I'm calling it alien now because there's something so completely unnatural about it and that that quote that came from the Gnostics that also referred to a false technology <clears throat> and I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to read it because I did I believe I posted it here. Yes. Read it. Um, it says, um, when Pis Pistis, which is the Pistis Sophia, I, I prefer the Sophia pronunciation. I've been using that my whole life. So, when Pistis saw the impiety of the Lord Archon, who claimed to be the only God, though not even a true God, she was filled with anger. And P.S. people, this is the anger that I'm talking about, okay? Um, continuing, acting in her invisible form, she spoke in this way. 
You are mistaken, blind one, false deity who cannot see. There is an immortal luminous child, the Anthropos, who came into existence before you and who will appear among your automata. This luminous child will trample you in scorn just as a potter's clay is pounded into a lump and you will sink away to your proper zone, the abyss, along with those who belong to your legion. For at the consummation of your work, the entire defect exposed in the light of truth will be abolished, and that will be as if it never had been. End of quote. Now, what I wanted to observe in this quote is that the word automata, I looked at the, uh, the etymology of this word, and it's basically automation, which is mechanical device or machinery or mathematics, but it, it has nothing to do with organic life or life. Hmm. Automata. So even in the Gnostics, they referred to the archons as automatons or robotics. Automatons. Automatons, which is what we call robotics. They have no life. They are a synthetic, artificial light. And these are the ones that are coming in and infiltrating and doing uh, all, all of these, giving all of these channel people messages because they're taking over the mind that, that, of the true luminous one. They're, they're, they're camouflaging the luminous light with their automated artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And just one point I want to bring out, I just can't help myself, but yeah. you know, in order for the Epistus Sophia to be able to use her divine wisdom, which is confrontation, her first reaction was what? She was filled with anger. Anger, anger yeah. Well, more. I'm not, I'm not saying that anger is a thing to be flinging around all the time, but you know what? This, this cannot be done by seeing no evil, speaking no evil, and hearing no evil, and being like a New Age Muppet who pretends like everything's wonderful, and you just don't think about it, all go away, and it's all in your own mind, it's just your bad karma, you know, yeah. but hey, you know, you got to confront the perps, plain and yeah. simple, this stuff is going to change unless you do a confrontation and call them for what they are, and see them for what they are, and don't play by their rules anymore. Well, with that in mind, I just needed to, because I have to, I mean, I... I got an email um, right before the show um, that I thought was like, it just blew me away and I had to stop everything I, I was doing to address it. Uh, because this is the kind of thing that is um, being, I guess, given uh, as, as a given <laughs> within the, what, the light worker community or the spiritual community. Uh, and it's and it's almost like a mantra. It's almost like an anthem that you know this is why everybody's looking away, you know, looking the other way, and everything is feel good and as it should be, and that type of thing. Which is a lot of the information that comes into the channel material is everything is in divine order. It's a, it's it's the way it's supposed to be. You know, let you know you're you're on course. You're already ascended. That type of thing, so that you don't look while these these guys, these evil doers, are doing all their dirty work. So anyway, uh, this is from a, a quote from a person by the name of John Wheeler. I'm not really familiar with this person. Does anybody know who this person is? Uh, is he a famous writer or something? I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with him. But the quote is the following. It says, See all suffering, doubts, questions, problems, issues, imagined attainments, and losses as movements in the mind. They are all thought-generated. Apart from thoughts, those things have no existence whatsoever. Nail this insight completely. Do not move from this until it is absolutely clear. There is nothing wrong with the body, mind, world, or other people at any time. Fighting with those things is completely futile. All problems are the mind's labels, judgments, and interpretations. We must see that all problems are sustained and created by the mind which is fabricating them. That is one aspect. Believing the thoughts to be true is where the real bondage arises because if you do not believe them, they have no power. But first you need to clearly see what you are dealing with. Thoughts, pure and simple. 
And that's it. John Wheeler. This is an example of what is being disseminated within the spiritual communities in different ways. Um, that is the, the whole essence behind the thing. And it's let live and let live. You know, everything is great and groovy. Kumbaya. Let's all sit and chant. You know, and 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 so. What is your opinion of this? <laughs> oh, I think that it's it's truth mixed in with lies, to you know. Otherwise, it's not palatable. Exactly. But it's kind of like jumping the gun and and not dealing with the issue. It would be like a, you know, a woman who's with an abuser who's screwing around on her, and then she's just trying to to do all her meditations and think everything's love and light, not confront them, and oh, just be the most positive, perfect wife she can be, and everything will be changed, you know. And then nothing changes because he's doing what he's doing, and that's not going to change unless you confront the perps. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> you can't deal with this unless you confront the goddamn perps. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't get this by now? <laughs> many, many. That's what's sad and what's very, uh, you know, disturbing, that many don't get it. Still. They will get a love bite relationship, and they got you get hammered over the head with one of these, and they'll be like, oh, my God, I believed all this was true until I had one of these relationships, so I just can't believe it. <laughs> yeah, that's me. That's me. I, I'm not happy to say exactly, and that's what got me here because I never – I mean, I was totally into all the new age stuff. It sounded so beautiful. I loved it. I was trying to manifest it. I was into the secret. I was listening to it in the, in the car all day long. And I'm like, how could this not be working? I'm giving it everything I have, 100%. I know it. I'm, it wasn't working. And, and then this uh, relationship hit me, whew, blindsided me. And um, it just on and on and on until I was like, you know, nothing I believe. It's true. Nothing. I could see that much, right? That much I could see. I'm looking at the world. I'm looking at my life. Nothing I believed was right, right? So that means I had to think the ugly stuff, right? The stuff I didn't want to go, you know, look at. And that, that's that been the most illuminating thing. Now, I've been getting results, positive results, by looking at the ugly stuff and handling it in a mature way, right? That's where I've been getting positive results. And, you know, I just had to say that. So I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people, Eve, you know. <laughs> I got blindsided by that relationship, and and now I see what is going on. Yeah, I mean, I think it's happened to most people who are unaware. I mean, they didn't know it existed until it happened to them, and then they had to reassess their belief systems to accommodate the, the reality that there are um, predators and perpetrators who are trying to stop your you know, spiritual progress of, of awakening. Yeah. And I think it does happen to women more often. And there really That's is no a deliberate point. Yeah. That is exactly the deliberate point is to yeah. stop or slow down or sabotage your spiritual empowerment and awakening. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And women are going to pick up on it first. So you have to keep them quiet, right? Yeah. And, and then make it all their fault. That's, that's, <laughs> it's all your fault. It's your hormones. That's it, what it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That it's it's pretty horrible. And um so with with that also we uh, wanted to ask you um you know a lot of these uh these forces are obviously trying to find ways of possessing uh you know people. Uh you know w what do you feel are some of the uh the ways whether it's stealth or not? <laughs> that they're getting in how, how are they actually doing this well there's yeah that's a good question because it's not always 100 percent the same for everyone right um, i think through trauma is definitely the main way and unhealed wounds of the heart and soul is is an entry way because of a weakness of unintegration and unhealing so healing is a tremendous uh solution to strengthening our spiritual resilience and our emotional intelligence, which again is one of these feminine wisdom intuitive things. Mm -hmm. uh, if we want to deal with something, we have to deal with healing the wounds, not shoving them under the carpet and not feeling feelings, thinking feelings are bad. And I mean, a lot of people don't want to go there. They don't want to deal with the shadow. So one of the things that I'm involved in is, is dealing with the shadow and learning how to heal and transmute those traumas and those feelings so that there's a reconnection with the divine 
soul and heart, and the heart part is really important. And then that helps you become aware to be able to see what's coming. Um, when those heal, when those wounds are unhealed, it creates blank spots in one's perception. So that's actually a vulnerability which will make it easier for you to be a victim. Right, yeah. right. Um, and so can you, now I know that you do sessions, right? Yes. Okay, can you tell us, I mean, how people can get in contact with you if they're interested? Um, yes, well, it's easy. My website is evelorgan.com, and then there's a, a button that, it's like a contact button, and under that would be if you wanted to set up a session, and then you could go to the PayPal section and, and set up a session for consultation. And I do different methods depending on what people are needing. Um, sometimes people just need support and to hear their story and you know get like my ideas on what I think is happening with them. Other people may want more of a hypnotherapeutic uh, approach to, to get some memories. Um, some people want to do the liberation processes, which I I think are good. They're created by Dr. Malanga. And they're called, um, there's three different methods that are used to eliminate alien interference and those issues related to alien abduction and MILABs. So sometimes these, these methods can also be adapted towards people having any kind of interference issue, including a psychic vampire kind of situation or a paranormal influence. So these things can be adapted. So I do actually many, many things. Fantastic. So, Fantastic. And uh, everyone, again, if uh, you're interested in picking up one of Eve's wonderful books, um, you know, we're talking about the uh, the Love Bite, Alien Interference of Human Love Relationships, or the Dark, dark Side of Cupid, Love Affairs, uh, the Supernatural and Energy Vampirism. Uh, you can pick them up at Amazon.com. Is that correct? That's correct. And then also my, um, my publisher, Keyhole Publishing, you could also get The Dark Side of Cupid through that. Fantastic. And, and so there's a couple different ways. I think Barnes & Noble, you can also get both books, but they're... Uh you have to order it, I believe. Very, very awesome. Well, we're getting at the uh, uh, end of the hour. Uh, we're gonna, we still have a, a, a wonderful, uh, another hour left to uh, to delve into these wonderful topics. Uh, but when we come back, uh, Eve, if you don't mind, I would really like to get more into uh, the archons and what your, uh, you know, what what you know about them. I, I know that there is. Uh, some kind of like a hierarchy uh, in reference to the fact that it's not just what we see here on the surface of the planet. I think you you kind of touched that uh, with when you were in with uh, in that show uh, with with George. Uh, so if you can t touch upon that or anything else that can help our listeners understand this better, we would really appreciate it. And in the meantime, uh, we're going to take a quick break and come right back. Okay.
And welcome back to Shattering the Matrix. We have our fantastic guest, Eve Lorgan, with us today. And we're going to be uh, delving even deeper, <laughs> as if it wasn't deep already. We're going to be getting uh, information that, uh, that hopefully will bring so, uh, some insight to many of you about uh, these forces that are currently on the planet and off planet that are keeping this planet hostage and in a system called uh, the Matrix, uh, very similar to that movie that came out. Um, and it looks pretty similar to that as well. Um, Eve, are you here with us? I am. Fantastic. Um, I think that, um, Serena, you had something that you wanted to comment on before we, you know, went into uh, the, the other topic I wanted to get into, which is the Archons a little bit more. Uh, you were talking uh, about the control factor, uh, what actually is controlling, that we're really not free, that people yeah. think we are. Can you, you want to talk, talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, um, to, yeah, to try and finish the point that I, w I forgot to make before when Eve was speaking and I wanted to bring up something and I read that quote from the Gnostic um, Nag Hammadi library about the Pista Sophia and uh, the automatons or the robotics that, that they refer to. Um, these, this is an artificial intelligence that has superimposed its paradigm over the human one because they don't want the human one to succeed because if we succeed then they cease to exist or they, they don't have the, you know, the chessboard to play with or whatever it is. Um, so she was talking something about the matrix and I was, I, the point that I was getting to in bringing that up was that I, it is clear that anyone who tries to create something outside of their matrix, outside of their reality or their paradigm or some system, the systems that they have set up is sabotaged. And that's why these communities, that these spiritual communities that try to, you know, develop, they fail. But anyone that tries to, as Eve says, you know, uh, think outside the box or live outside of the box, the box is the matrix. They, they will be sabotaged. There is deliberate sabotage. It comes in and you don't even have to tell anybody um, what your plans are because it's, they're watching you from the non-physical realm, from the non-physical realm. And, and so therefore they're being controlled. People are being controlled from the non-physical realm. Wow. And so we're not, we're not, we're not free at all. You, you, you're free to choose anything that is here in their matrix you know, you can choose what kind of car they produce for you. You can choose what kind of education that they set up for you in colleges, and you can choose any of those careers and a life within this prison, but you can't choose something outside of it. Like if you're trying to develop a spiritual community that lives on a system of bartering and, you know, free life and free religion and living in peace, oh, my God, forget that. <laughs> That's not going to be allowed. No. Have you seen it allowed anywhere? <laughs> Tell me the populations or the continents where the people are living in this kind of freedom with the abundance of the land. And, and, even, and even when they actually, uh, when people actually get on the same page and get on the same piece of land and actually uh, with good intentions come together to form these type of communities that are going to step out of the matrix. In uh, comes the archons. Egg, egg, in, in comes the archons and then what do we, what do we see? We see conflicts, uh, uh, personality issues, we see ego. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've never, it, it never fails. I have never not seen that. I have never not seen that. Uh, very, it's just very blatant. Therein lies the, the proof, right? There's, of, of, there's something else there. And actually one of the solutions that um, I found is, is certainly worth looking into uh, is something that Dr. Karata Malanga discovered with working with abductees and people who've had the alien encounter experience many times along with Milabs, I guess, because sometimes that's also inclusive in that. But what he found is how aliens, or what we're calling aliens in different kind of ETs who take different forms and images, will parasite the, the abductee or the human. And so there's, there's ways of parasitism that they access into different parts of our being to access the soul energy and then basically direct and control the mind and the behavior so that those people carry out the agenda of those alien parasites. So one of the reasons why I think so many people have a hard time escaping is that maybe they still have some of these alien parasites within them or within their energy field or around someone close to them. 
Um, and this is like the sabotage element that I talked about earlier, like that, that was definitely manifested more profoundly in people wanting to um, get their memories back of alien abduction, uh, whether they're breaking programming or they're wanting to integrate um, their personalities from traumas um, and ritual abuse, for example. The, the alien parasite is one of the ways in which they constantly uh, manipulate the lives of those people without them really knowing that it's there. So it's kind of hard to know because they, they make you blind at the same time. So what Malanga found was that there were certain places and entrance ways that these parasites would attach, like um, any person who had the alien abduction experience, like multiple encounters, would have what he calls an active alien memory component within their mind slash brain and that this is actually a part of an alien which may take a, a saurian form, a locust form, a gray form, reptilian, mantis, whatever, and then uh, it embeds its, its mind and its spirit component within the brain slash mind of the individual. And then that actually controls the, the person's life and keeps them in this disconnect between their mind, spirit, and soul components so that they're not able to directly access the soul wisdom. It's like they're blocked off from themselves, the divine part of themselves. Wow. And then oftentimes they'll think that they were an alien in a past life or they're getting messages from their spirit guides or they're getting these quote telepathic messages, but it's really the alien parasite speaking to them. So one of the ways is to, to remove that alien parasite through the, uh, I guess it's like a guided visualization procedure. So that's actually one level in which is a reason why if you keep being sabotaged and you're somebody who's had alien encounters, then it could be the, the parasite issue, which is actually working from within you, but you don't know it. Jeez. Or, you know, the alien implants. And of course, the second level, like after you remove those alien implants and parasites and you remove those entities and there's different kinds, and that's like a whole different topic that I could talk about too. Once you remove those, then you come into realizing that they may want to manipulate the people around you or try to access you in a different way. And then this becomes a battle of awareness by being able to be aware of how they're accessing your mind and your reality. So they'll try to access you physically, but they first have to access your mind and your consciousness and your awareness. And then once they can get your unawareness, then they hack in and then they abduct you. And, and it's hard to say if it's always a physical event. Sometimes I think it's non-physical or it's a virtual reality experience. Once they're able to access your mind through the unaware part that's disconnected or affected by the parasite. So, and then you could notice them like hacking into your dreams, your dream reality. So you have to basically catch them while they're doing it and be able to use your soul awareness once you have that connection going to zap them just simply through your willpower and your ability to visualize and imagine them basically going away. But in order to have that really work, you have to have a deep soul connection going on. So really what I notice is that, you know, it sounds simple, <laughs> maybe it doesn't sound simple, huh. but to, in order to even have the soul connection, you have to go through the heart. The heart is a significant portal to the connection with the soul. That's so what I think, yeah, so when I'm working with people, what will happen is a lot of times, you know, they feel numb, you know, they don't feel like they're connecting with anything, nothing's coming up, and they're kind of like in this dull state. But when you get the connection, sometimes, you know, feelings come up, and it's important to address those feelings and be present with whatever those feelings are instead of run away from them and go through the processing of those feelings to get underneath um, what really happened. Like, you know, what are those feelings? What are the needs beneath those feelings that were or were not being addressed? Um, why is that being interacting with them? What do they really want? How do they feel about it? And so you have to go through all of that to get to a deeper soul connection. So in the patriarchal world, again, they are more likely to avoid feeling uh, and avoid that connection because it's not as innate to men on the left side of the brain who function more on the left side of the brain. So it's really important to get back to that intuitive heart soul connection because that therein lies your power therein lies your awareness That's so if right. we want our power back we have to go through that part of us which is innately a feminine aspect a feminine wisdom aspect so this is what really gets me with with so many of the methods and the ideologies and the value systems that they completely take out of that 
that component and not recognize its power. Um, I think therapists know it, but um, most people in the in the world they they think it has no value. They just they just so use why it is that? Right. And, and the science and that's because they're affected by the parasite itself. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, in the belief systems, the dominator systems, they're they're taken over. So we have to get them to understand that they're under an illusion of a parasite and reconnect with the true essence of their being, which is really a wonderful, wonderful thing. Because you become more aware, you become more feeling, you start feeling more joy, you start feeling feelings, you start feeling what your true nature is, your, you know, what your dreams are, and of course that could be a whole, uh, what do you call it, uh, life-changing event that in and of itself, like uh, I don't know what they call it, the midlife crisis. Yeah. Because yeah. then you have to assess what you've been believing all your life. Um, you know, what kind of career did you have? What kind of relationships you have? And you know, what kind of guidance and belief system were you under when you made those decisions? So let's say, you know, I was a scientist for many years, and I actually denied my feminine, intuitive nature of who I really was. In essence, I was more of a, a poet and a dancer and oh. a yogi and uh, and a writer, and, and I had to deny that part of myself because i got to make a living or I'll be out on the streets, you know? Yeah. So I had to deny my nature and, and then, you know, actually get back to that through therapeutic process of reconnecting with, well, pain. Pain and suffering was what brought me to that awareness and brought me to a reconnection with that. So that's a therapeutic process which is essentially something that women have more of an awareness about and will want to do. See, but see, that's what needs to be valued. We want our power back as a race. We better listen to women. Exactly. Amen. Ooh, ooh, Amen. Well said. <laughs> wow. Well said. It's about time. Yeah. We hear that. Yes. Well said. Wonderful. Not that there's not a lot of wise men out there. There, there are, but um, there's just not enough. I mean, I think that emotional intelligence is, is a real important Aspects. I talk about that in my book about how important emotional intelligence is and it's such a significant part of the balancing of the human wisdom. We want wisdom. We've got to know how to access that. And wisdom is much more than an intellectual, rational process. It's, it's emotional intelligence and deep spiritual soul connection where you really know what your power is. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Well said. And you know what I'm finding is that there are a lot of people, especially amongst the left brainers, let's just leave it at that reference, who say that anything that involves emotions is negative. And, you know, you hear people talking about amazing things like what we're talking about, for example, and they'll say, well, it's so cool that you're able to talk about this without emotions. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm, very important to leave all emotions out of it and not, not get emotional about this and just deal with it. And I'm like, but, but wait a minute, they're missing the entire point. There, there is an entire population of people on the planet who believe that emotions are evil. Yeah. Emotions are bad. And I think this is a pure projection because if okay. all of your emotions have been negative, for example, anger, okay? If your anger is the kind that says, oh, I want to go out and kill somebody, and you'll go out and be the mass murderer, or you'll be the pedophile, or you'll rape a woman, or beat a woman, or, or cause, cause a crash, or whatever, you know, psychopathic anger does, then anger is a problem there, right? But if you're a woman who's protecting your child, for example, from a pedophile, or from one of these crazy people, then your anger has to be there for, to give you that speed, that energy, and that faster than lightning movement that you need to protect the one that you're protecting. There's two completely different kinds of anger. And yeah, that's people, right. Yeah. yeah, these people who talk about getting rid of anger, anger is all bad and it's negative. And, and no, they're, they're, they're just projecting their own anger and how dangerous it's been for them. But they don't understand that anger is necessary to create change. And this is called righteous anger. It's not psychopathic anger. It's righteous anger. Yeah, and anger actually is a, is a secondary emotion, except for maybe righteous anger because that's, you're doing the right thing by protecting your child. Like that's that's like a maternal instinct. But in, in working with people, um, like in compassionate communication and what I call the emotional process work, where we're getting deeper to trying to resolve the original issue that's causing these compulsive fears or phobias or whatever it is. Sometimes um, people stay stuck in certain in certain emotions and they go through this cyclic loop of just never being able to get out of cyclic anger or rage or or depression or sadness and and so sometimes emotions have to be processed through where you get to the the final level 
of what needs to be addressed with compassion, and then then you'll then you'll get a break, and then you usually you know get through an impasse, and, and then get to the to the core. And a lot of times, the core feelings of a, whatever the trauma is happens, let's say in your younger years, when you have core traumas of when you're a real young child. Those are the core feelings that really need to be dealt with like uh, shame and abandonment and, and despair and, or, or terror or just abject fear. You have to deal with those in order to get through to the original issue. And ultimately, in my view, a, a grieving process has to take place in order for the ultimate resolution. And grieving is, is really there's a loss that took place at some point in their life, a loss of their beliefs of security or a loss of their childhood or a loss of a loved one. A loss of innocence. And, you know, grief, the grieving process and the bereavement process is several stages in and of itself that, you know, you have to go through it step by step um, when you're ready to do that. And, and forgiveness is part of that. So. The healing process takes many steps, and I think most people kind of stay stuck and they don't want to go past a certain emotion or feeling, so they stay in this perpetual stuckness, but the stuckness keeps them numb and keeps them unaware, and it actually keeps them from being able to relate intimately and to be able to love fully and access their own wisdom. I so agree. the therapeutic process is absolutely essential to tapping into your power. I agree. I agree, and one of the things that I want to say about the trauma that happens as a child is I'm starting to believe because I'm seeing it and I have to confirm this, I don't know, I would have to do some more research on this, but I'm starting to suspect that a lot of the traumas that happen to children at that young age is deliberately our context. Those, those are situations that are set up deliberately to compromise the human being at that early age because they understand that there is an entire agenda on this planet of negating emotions and negating their value, um, you know, deeming them, labeling them as negative and, you know, putting this, this stigma on them, oh, emotions are this thing that women do, just ignore them, they're just hormonal, hysterical and all of that. And so, while they give you these traumas that cause this huge breach in your innocence and in your connection with soul because you've been traumatized by something you're completely unfamiliar with and you don't know how to heal that. You don't know how to heal that and often you'll go and grow up and go through life with this trauma still unhealed because you really, you, it, was, it, it was blindsided, right? And then you're growing up in a world that is negating, nurturing the emotion. Yep. This is a, this is completely an alien agenda. This is okay, a, this a is. complete setup. Yeah, and a perfect micro, you know, environment of that is living with a psychopath or, or someone who completely negates your reality and then tries to tell you what your reality is, what your feelings are, what they should or should not be until you absolutely go crazy and they, then they call you crazy, make you the crazy one, but in reality, <laughs> you know, they're the crazy one. Yes. So, They've denied the. They've denied their soul. Their souls are completely cut off. Yes. Or mostly cut off. Yes. This is what happens. Ari, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, Eve. How many people? I mean, if you even thought of this number, would you say that are experiencing some kind of uh, archontic slash evil forces possession, whatever, on this planet? Do you feel it's a really high number? Well, it's, I think it's a high number with, within the UFO, alien, and New Age communities that we're finding out more and more hmm. that it targets, it does target certain spiritual groups or groups that have more um, trauma or negative emotions or let's say drug addictions like methamphetamine and alcohol addiction or people involved in wars and uh, high combat and violence that it's going to affect those people more because there's a window of vulnerability with those kinds of people and situations. Yeah, I, I've heard that uh, that some people, uh, especially if they're into uh, abuse, like uh, drug abuse, alcohol, uh, even tobacco I've even heard, uh, it opens up uh, pockets where these things come in. Have you heard that? Yes. Hmm. Um, not so much smoking, but definitely alcohol and uh, methamphetamine and um, actually Pornography, like uh, addiction, pornography addiction, and um, you know where they really, I guess, well, what's the word? 
subvert and desacredize yeah. the sexual act and turn it into a, just a perversion, like in perversions. And one of the things that James Farley and I had discovered when we actually, James really worked a lot with the reptilian uh, manipulations and understanding the reptilian mind. And he, he wrote an article called, uh, what was it? Uh, reptilian Astral Dreamscape Manipulation, where he was able to, you know, interview many people who had direct uh, experiences with the, the reptoid, reptilian intelligence, manipulating them on various levels, especially in the dreamscape and the kinds of uh, imagery that they would project in order to basically pervert them in many different ways and how some of them became, they were, and went from normal heterosexuals until to be porn addicted into ped, pedophilia and meth crank addiction and it's basically they, they tried to run them into the wall of a just a completely perverted, subverted person. Yeah, and the, the, the homosexuality uh, is rampant with them and I think that this is what has happened with the Vatican and all the priests and what is going on there. There is an, a deep, dark per sexual perversion that, that permeates that entire institution all over the world. And I think there's something about the, um, well, we'll call it the archontic parasite or the archontic mind this is something that came up in one of my interviews. Uh, I guess it was Oris Ra as the Archontic Alien Parasite. I don't know if it's the, the exact title, but it was a, a second interview I did with a female Milab abductee named Marit. And she was one of these really clear, aware people who had, you know, very good psychic abilities. That was one reason why they used her in these projects as well as medical experimentation and genetic uh, she thought she was genetically altered, like many abductees believe that they're being used in some kind of genetic experimentation. But one of the things that Marie discovered, it was they, they, I guess her controllers, which included humans and occultists and reptilians and dracos, were basically trying to um, possess her with a archontic parasite, um, which she identified through Malanga's definitions, right? of uh, what we call Oris Ra. Okay, so Oris Ra is actually an image of Oris they're using because it had a chicken-like kind of body and face. And it was a particular entity that was very high on the hierarchy of the aliens in charge. As we move up, there's a type of hierarchy. And this particular being was believed to be from what they called the dark universe. There's like a light universe and then there's a dark universe. And so basically this type of entity which took that form in order to interact with us was really nothing more than a black dot or shadow or some intelligence that had the essence of extreme intelligence and desire to corrupt the purity of someone and also had great uh, psychic ability and arrogance. And so, and this was the type of parasite that came from the dark universe that would want to parasite someone and use them to carry out their agenda through all their other archontized people. But she was able to identify this as a mind parasite that actually exists in everyone to a certain degree, much like the shamans of the Carlos Castaneda material. And, and so in order to, you know, I guess to avoid that, you would want to avoid envy and jealousy and arrogance and basically being an asshole. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. But there's certain behaviors that are characteristic of that mind parasite that if it's not nipped in the bud, um, then it could basically take over someone entirely. But, you know, they also have extreme intelligence and extreme psychic abilities so that when she felt this thing in her, she felt the energy. In fact, her son even commented on it because he was psychic too. He was only like five years old. He was able to perceive her after this whole abduction thing took place where they were trying to possess her with this archontic entity that she, he said like, oh, mom, I saw that like this black light all over you. And he even noticed that the energy was different and she felt it, but she fought it. And she was able to fight it because of her awareness and her intention to stay true to her own soul and to reconnect with her soul. But she did know that for a fact, this, this energy um, does exist in people, but it's stronger in some than others. And, you know, to defend against it, you would want to basically you know, uh, have more of a purity of your own soul and heart and loving and be aware and 
use your own wisdom and not be arrogant and uh, envious and jealous and, uh, you know, uh, like a predator. All of those are conflict things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I just thought that it was, it was amazing because she had this, this great articulate awareness and wisdom to be able to explain her experience and define it so clearly to what we knew it was happening, but we couldn't really prove it. You know what I mean? It, this is so subjective because you're dealing with people's perception of their experiences. And rarely do you find someone so aware in, you know, within the whole subpopulation of the abductees and the millabs. You know, most people don't remember all their experiences. Most of them are dealing with a significant amount of trauma who haven't really dealt with all their issues, who don't have the support or the ability to really do the complete therapeutic process. And that is, a, and is an issue because we want to create community and the ability to deal with these things, but those communities are often sabotaged, those therapists are sabotaged. So this is what we're dealing with when we start thinking outside the box and, and being able to recognize the archontic parasite, who's controlling them, how they're controlling, completely taking over certain groups of people. Um, then like once they know who you are, because you recognize them, then then the war is on. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a lot like what George Kavasilis, you know, described in his experiences where, um, and I had experiences similar to that, but we kind of talked about on his show about all the different levels of deception, how they move through different images and hierarchies to try to try to catch you, basically, try to capture your attention and your worship and your belief yeah. in them. And so it, it really calls into question your ability to discern and stand true to the core of your soul and the core of your heart and soul. Instead of running after deities, running after religions, um, it's, it's really a test, a great test. Well yeah. said, well Steve. said, wow. Yeah, Steve, yeah, excellent. I, I really love everything. I think everything she says is well said. I could listen to her, I mean, for hours. But I do, I have two questions now, okay? The first one would be about those people who wake up um, after a night of sleep with all kinds of unusual bruises on their bodies. Um, and this is even for people who have no experience with UFOs. That's question number one. And the other question is, um, based on what you just said, I'm, I'm seeing a pattern, right? And this may be redundant, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, these people who have these alien, quote unquote, alien abductions, because I'm starting to question that too, because I think some of this uh, angelic stuff that comes from the Catholic religion or the Christian religion where they have all of these um, arch angels, and arch, by the way, if you look at the um, etymology of arch, it's, it's against, isn't it? Arch is like rival or something. So there are archangels and with all these names and, you know, new age people who channel uh, ETs or archangels or ascended masters, aliens, whatever, whatever camp you're in. And um, they're having these experiences, especially with these abductions. Um, they have been traumatized. It, what, you know, I, I'm, I'm not understanding why trauma and pain and suffering have to be part of these experience for the most part, that's, that's what's happening. And then these experiences are followed immediately by my lab or, mm -hmm. or MILABs, military uh, abductions, yeah. who are coming after these people. And is it, is it true that they're coming after them because A, they want to tap into the psychic abilities of these people because they know something about the relationship that exists between the abductee and the ones who are abducting them? Or are they just interfering with these beings because maybe they know something about this hybrid race that we don't? Something else? Well, I mean, that's a, a big question, so I'll just kind of start with them. Um, the bruises and the body marks, because they do happen, and it appears that something physical really took place, although sometimes I think that they're able to take you energetically or transform your vibrational frequency to their reality, where they could work on you basically in that other dimensional frequency, and then, then take you back or convert you back to your reality, and then your body just like manifests those energetic changes. So it's almost like a stigmata kind of thing, even though definitely there's physical after effects that people report that I can't deny. 
but there's also things that it, it couldn't possibly have been physical and you still wake up with marks and you can't figure out how the hell it happened, you know? Yeah. Um, but there are experiences where people can have positive connections with other beings. And I believe that there, there's certain military groups, intel groups that have technology to detect uh, certain interactions that are non-human or whatever and then they'll they'll maybe follow you and then abduct you and interrogate you about those experiences so they they like to get that intel from you about who you're interacting with and is that a security threat to their agenda so i think that's one reason for a lot of the milabs is they consider the abductees a security threat if, if indeed there really is an ET presence and they're interacting with people and they don't fully understand and know what they're doing, then that's a security risk that they're going to find out as much as they can by re-abducting them and giving them screen memories. But they don't. that's not just the reason why they take them, though. Often what has been reported in my Love Bite book and other articles is that like you said, they, they may inflict trauma, there may be an alien interaction, let's say the, the reptilian sexual thing, it was a common report where the woman would get activated sexually with a kundalini raising and her energy would be very amplified through that sexual assault or sometimes it was pleasant for the woman. I'm not saying that it was always an unpleasant thing, but you know sometimes it is, and um, or lots of times it is, it depends on the experiencer. But then the military will come on the tail end of that because her energy has been amplified and her psychic abilities are more tuned in and then they go ahead and use her on what I call the mind control ops in an alternate reality and that could be you know remote viewing or psychically tuning into somebody to get intel for them so they use them as operatives because they know they have these abilities or they may have an entity within them like one of these alien parasites that has advanced knowledge of physics or alien symbols or alien languages and then they go and access that alien within them that sometimes the abductee can't do themselves. It's almost like a alter personality kind of thing that they could access information that way. It's just like the Gua'ul, the Gua'ul from yeah. the uh, Stargate series. It's the same exact thing. Yeah, yeah, similar. Isn't it? Very similar. Except there's, you know, variations in, on this, but um, not all abductees can access their abilities, and that's one of the big issues with the Milabs and the super soldiers is how they can integrate their personalities and access the abilities that they know that they have. And so, so then they're not really super soldiers, they're rather sleeper soldiers because they don't know the abilities they have until they they're taken by this other force and then used, you know, for their abilities in a rather unconscious or astral state. Yes, yes. I mean, they even have astral altars where um, there may be a part of them that has these awesome capabilities that they didn't even know they had, like bilocation, for example. And I've had, you know, a super soldier, you know, he was able to bilocate this ultra personality that was put into him and, and do all these amazing things, and, uh, but he didn't have control over it. And so that's always the problem is that they don't always have access to how to access their own parts of themselves and very often it has to do with the original trauma and split in which it occurred and then if you can integrate those parts and you know get down to the trauma and the integration oftentimes you can reintegrate and become co-conscious with that part but that it's very difficult because in, in it gets really complex because in the super soldiers and the milabs and the ritual abuse you have the complication of the occult rituals that are done to them or they're forced to do to take in demons and entities which act as guardians to the programs and guardians to the alternate personalities so they can't get well unless you get rid of those entities first. I think well, somebody had a question so I'll just pause and Oh, no, no, that's cool. That's cool. You're you're, you're going you're going in the in, I mean describing something that is extremely crucial. I just wanted you to when you finish with your train of thought, if I didn't interrupt it already, um, if you can go into the what's really going on behind the scenes. I mean, we're seeing this manifest with uh, possessions and milab abductions and all kinds of things, right? But I mean, we're just seeing what we see. I mean, this is like the the, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, yeah. Can 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 you go into? Can you really like explain to the listeners what it, what really goes on behind the scenes? What what is really going on? I mean, and, and who animates that? And and who animates those? 
Oh, you know? Yeah, well, the, the hierarchy thing is, uh, is always fascinating to me. And I learned through my own personal experience, and but also what from Malanga has brought out in his research with the alien hierarchies and what he calls his Genesis 1, 2, and 3 articles, which still, I mean, the Genesis 1 is in English, but the 2 and 3 is still in Italian, so you have to do a Google translation. But basically, there's, there's hierarchies of entities who may take various forms and masks, but in reality, the, the core behind them are the incorporeal entities which parasite the human. And so there's two main, I think there's actually three main types of parasites that he identified. Um, there was two that were from, quote, the, the dark universe or the black universe or the anti-universe, whatever you want to call it, and then one from the light universe, which is the looks being, which is like a, this white ball of energy intelligence, which he claimed that it was an emanation of Lucifer. But then the other two, as I think they called it, the growl and the orus Ra. And the growl, they, the reason why they called it growl, and of course it's a translation from Italian, but in his sessions with people, I guess when he was removing these, quote, entities and parasites, the growl, the growl one would have a particular way of, it would sometimes resist getting removed, like in an exorcism, where it would growl and make these faces like, like a lizard face or whatever, and just like resist, and, and people's faces might be contorted while this thing was coming out of them. So that's why they called it the growl. But and how, how, how similar does that sound to growl? Oh, very similar. It's actually very similar to what I think was the reptilian possession issue because we, I was seeing these reports over and over again with a particular perception of this lizard, snake-like, gargoyle being, um, you know, inhabiting someone or overshadowing them and taking on different behaviors. And, you know, they have, they have energy vampirism behaviors. They're always into this you know, amplifying your sexual energy or doing <laughs> what James Barley called the astral rape toids, where, you know, they'd always be doing this astral rape crap. And um, so there's there's certain ways that these parasites attach. So there was the growl and the orus ra, which were the two, I guess, from the black universe, the dark universe. And then I believe it was, there's two places they attach. One of them was at the bottom of the tailbone, the sacrum. And then another area in and along the spine, and so they will attach in certain places where they could feed off your Kundalini energy. In addition to the different implants, which facilitate um, keeping them there and feeding off energy or blocking energy pathways, so it blocks your consciousness and it blocks the connection between mind, spirit, and soul in your body. So once you remove that and you remove the parasites, you you can have more of a a clear energetic connection and and then you start you know you start your life being a free and not having to run after deities and it, it's it's really difficult because I know that Malanga he's basically against all religions I don't want to say that in black and white but basically and we, we run the risk of becoming controlled by these entities that are claiming to be our gods and we really don't know who they are until we realize our true nature so I guess that's just the way it is on this planet with all the religions and the, the deities and we don't really know who we're praying to sometimes. Wow, that's crazy. Uh, now, what is your opinion, if you even have one, of the ones that uh, have been known as Jehovah or yod heh vod -Hey or any of those? Are you familiar enough to be able to discuss that? Is it, Are these, um, you know, considered... Uh, the creator or are these one of these sub uh, gods or deities that uh, that could be also imposters um, well that's something that Malanga talked about in, in his Genesis 2 and 3 articles and how we have a hierarchy let's say um, I don't have the article in front of me but I have one about the alien hierarchies you know they'd be the greys and then there'd be different kinds of uh, reptilians and the Nordic types and the mantis locust types, and then the orus Ra, and then above, the, and then the orus Ra was, there was actually the six-fingered blonde, which was pretty high on the hierarchy, um, and then there was the, what they called the primordial man, who was akin to the Adam Kadmon figure in some of our other religious myths, and the Adam Kadmon is 
I guess, the one who's in charge of all the aliens and who created the aliens, uh, according to his theory. And so I guess the thing with the father figure, he would show up like a father god. So his archetype would be similar to what the Yahweh and the father god thing. Mm -hmm. Because he would always, he would hook onto your soul so that you always have to be recycled back to him. And so you'd never, like in, in Buddhism, you want to become free from the cycle of rebirth. Sure. And to be able to realize your true nature without being entrapped here, unless you choose to come back and you choose the conditions because you've been able to do that. But not everybody can choose because they're not yet free of that cycle. So the whole idea is to become free from these different deities and levels of these creators, creator gods so that you can basically choose whether or not you want to come back or whether or not you want to come back just to help others. But um, the father figure was one that I think was involved in the father god patriarchal figure. And this is, this is the being that I believe that I interacted with personally in several years ago, but actually over a number of years when I was facing my own abductions and what I call the love bite and the, and the entities acting behind all these different alien images, I came into contact with this archetypal father figure who would show up in many different images in my dreams and very lucid dream visitations. I mean, they were like visitations. I mean, they were very powerful and unmistakable. And I didn't really understand it at the time. I was thinking he was like the beloved father figure. But after I learned Malanga's work and did some sessions with his colleagues to free, you know, from that father figure, I no longer had experiences with that being. So in, in my position, that being wasn't evil to me. It was actually loving, and but it was also a trickster in many ways. Yeah. So uh, I guess George and I kind of talked a bit about that, how there was, you know, you, you look up to these beings, then you come to find out that they're, they're conning you still, so you have to just really, it's like a shamanic initiation to really tap into your own uh, essence and also being realistic about what your unhealed wounds are and being honest with yourself about, you know, doing the therapy or the counseling or healing those traumas and the you know, relationship issues so that you don't become vulnerable to their manipulations because they will throw everything at you in your vulnerable state and then you'll want to believe it because they make you feel special and then it's a big con, you know. Right. right. So. So the karmic okay. cycle. So the karmic. Yeah. So the karmic cycle. You would. Uh, is it is it pretty uh, safe kind of to assume that might be under the control of your contact forces? I believe so. Now I do. Mm -hmm. Although people think that. Oh well, you know, it's because of your karma and there's that whole, you know, Buddhist and Eastern religion thing but when you when you go into the higher realms of like Achi yoga and Dzogchen um, you come to find out that if you can reach this realized remembrance of the true divine nature which is connected to the all at it that is that means it goes goes beyond the creator gods it goes beyond the deities it goes to the the non-dual essence of all that is then we have a connection to that and you can realize and sustain that then you can bypass the archontic rules of the matrix that's the whole idea. That is key. Exactly. But it's, it's not an easy thing to do. It sounds simple, but in order to even get to that process, you know, we usually awaken slowly and we, our awareness grows as we grow in experience. And I mean, there's a lot of shamans who are very aware, but they're still dealing with these forces and, and doing what they do to, to offset, you know, the archontic influences or different entities or exorcists. You know, we'll use the name of Jesus Christ to have authority over them. And so there's different ways to deal with this. So, I mean, I'm just not there yet. I'm not, I'm not an enlightened being, so I would like to be. But I think that you need allies until you realize this yourself. My sense is that's why shamans work with allies and people use the authority of the name of Jesus Christ and the other helpful entities or guides until they tap into their own power. So it's really about tapping into your own power and realization to understand how you know the rules of the game and you know how to get out of the box, basically, get out of the matrix. Right. Wow. A very multi-dimensional, many-layered matrix. Yes. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. Uh, it's it's you know what what just baffles me is the the main many layers 
that are above even the matrix that we see. <laughs> it's like, oh my lord, you know, it's like, okay, so we're going to get, uh, we're all going to stand in our power and rise up and, you know, humanity says we've had enough, we're taking this over, and then you've got, well, okay, so we got the first, we, we, we got the infantry. <laughs> it's like a video game where you go through all these levels, but there's another um, solution-oriented thing that I didn't mention. It has to do with John Lash's work that he calls Planetary Tantra, and I'm, I'm actually just learning about it, so I don't proclaim to, to know it and experience it, but another one of the methods of becoming free is, is connecting with the living consciousness of the Earth, which they call Sophia Gaia, They also the divine wisdom goddess of the living planet and to connect with her and connect with her organic light in order to affect the changes that you want. So you work with her and interact with her to offset the archontic predation that's happening. And so you work with her to make that, quote, correction. Because in that Gaia mythos, this is the time we're living through now is the correction time. In order to make that correction happen, and the correction is confrontation and ultimate victory over this archontic thing by illuminating who and what they are so they have no more power, basically, like in that scripture. I don't know if that was the one that you quoted. Yes. But, you know, in order to do that, we have to be interactive with part of our living essence, which is understanding even what the earth is. And our other religions, especially the patriarchal ones and the dominator ones, have removed that part of the equation because it removes how we access our power. So that's another element of accessing and accessing the power of who we are as humans on this planet. Yes. So it's yes. another level of solutions. But learning how to do that, I'm, I'm not an expert because I really haven't been there yet. Right. Well, I have a, a simple way. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What he's, all he's basically saying is to reconnect yourself with the mother again because the mother has been severed from humanity, from, from every single religion. The mother bears no importance or she's a secondary figure or she's just a vessel that gives birth and that's it. Um, and people who reconnect to the mother or have love for the mother or even as much as have respect for the mother and seek speak of these things, they, have you noticed that they're, they are like fringe people? You yeah. know, anybody that speaks well of the mother is like on the fringe of society because, because it goes back to all the way the beginning of creation and the patriarchy, uh, the patriarchal archontic types that came in and severed the, the feminine from the luminous child, right? And this has been the entire paradigm of what they've done to humanity up until this point. This is exactly what we're seeing. So all people have to really do is connect with nature and develop a love for the mother, a love for the feminine, a love for women, a love for what they are. You just have to love them. Start working with the earth and with the trees and the soil and the plants and have that relationship. And that will literally protect you. I mean, that's also spoken about in the Anastasia series of books, oh. that when you have your land and you grow your land with, with a beautiful plan to, to grow a, a place that's going to nurture you and your children and sustain you, one that's in harmony with your mother, the earth, that that land and those trees and those plants will literally protect you because there is a consciousness there. You see, and the archontic forces knew this, and that's why they say in the, in the archons, this is the quote. The archons came to Adam when they saw that Eve talking to, when they saw Eve talking to him, they said to each other, what sort of creature is this luminous woman? Now come, let us lay hold of her and cast our seed into her that she may become soiled and unable to access her inner light then those who she bears will be under our charge. But Eve, being a free power, laughed at their decision. She put mist in their eyes and escaped them. End of quote. This, jumping is, the tree. Yeah. this is the secret. This is what we have to do. We have to laugh at their decision and put mist in their eyes. I have to figure out that one, what that means. <laughs> but we do have to connect with Eve, the mother, 
we have to love the mother and we have to get back to our soil. Now, not everybody is of the human species. Just because they're in a human body, that doesn't mean they're of the human species. Not everybody can relate to the mother this way. But those of us who can should be able to do this. And this is the easiest, most beautiful, and it is the most enlightening and fun way of escaping the matrix. And this is what they're working against. That's why they're polluting it. They're polluting the waters. That's why they come trailing the skies. They're putting fluoride in babies' drinking water, babies who don't even have teeth. Okay? That's why every seed has been genetically modified. This is a completely alien agenda because they're, 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 they're uh, how do you say, um, polluting the entire planet. They're, they're destroying the mother, right? Because they don't want this one to have a healthy connection with her own luminous child. This is completely our concept. But when we do do that, we are completely outside of the matrix, outside of it. That's good. I, I believe that. It's just uh, connecting with the earth and loving, definitely loving women, and that's, that's a hard one. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard. Okay. You know, no, the woman is not trying to take over. The, the feminine is not trying to control your life. She doesn't want to dominate you. She doesn't want you as a slave. She doesn't want you serving serving uh, her perverted agenda. This is not what the, what the matriarchy is about. This is not what the mother is about. That's what the patriarchy is about. The mother is a completely different thing. That's why you will not find matri matriarchal cultures on this planet because they're two people. They're completely in opposition to the Archon agenda. Completely. Yeah. Except in India there might be still some cults out there or lineages that are matriarchal. I used to actually study under a shaman from India who was from one of these matriarchal lineages, which was pretty fascinating, you know, and definitely um, it's good. The women held a lot of that sacred knowledge and power in his lineage, and um, I think it's good to have that. Because yeah, and that's why it's called a cult, because it's so small. It's such a small little, you know, uh, area, section. Yes. Or population, a group of people, small. It's just learning how to connect and... Um, being able to relax and live with the earth and not have to struggle for survival in all these other ways, you know? Right. Because with the mother, with earth, living in, in harmony with the earth, in that symbiotic relationship that is natural to us, there is no struggle because she produces everything that we could possibly need. Yeah. It's really simple. Living in the mountains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with trees and... Yeah. Yeah. Well, but it's a, it's a process. It's a process of awareness and connection, and and learning what connection really means is, for me, you know, having 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 to heal wounds and uh, to be honest about you know, belief systems and hurts and pains that were repressed, and um, you know, it was a process that took time for me. I'm still in that process, you know. Yeah, we all are. Awesome. Well, we're getting down the basically winding down. Uh, the uh, our show this this time around because I know that Eve will be on our show many many times God willing in the future. Um, Eve, can you tell us one more time how uh, people can get in touch with you if they're interested in doing a, a session with you? Oh well, yes, yeah, just, just go to my website at evelorgan.com. It's, it's also uh, alienlovebite.com. Um, and just go to the menu button on the right that says contact and then there will be instructions on if you want to set up a session or you can send a little message to me. And um, I believe the book just go directly through Amazon.com or Keyhole Publishing or Barnes & Noble. They also have my book. Fantastic. And, uh, and can you tell us like in a brief synopsis, uh, we've got probably about six minutes left, just a little bit about each book. Oh, okay. Well, the, 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 the Love Bite I published in 2000, the year 2000, and that was, boy, that's like 12 years ago now, 13 years ago, wow. oh my God. And um, that was mostly about how I discovered um, alien abductees and Milabs were having their personal love relationships interfered with or orchestrated or disrupted by the alien beings that they knew were taking them and they were bonding them maybe several times throughout their lives until they met that partner and then there was like a fantastic deja vu, a recognition, a chemistry, but it played out in this particular drama 
where there was unrequited love and there was a lot of emotional ups and downs and the, and the aliens were basically pulling their emotional chains right and left, creating this drama of the love obsession. Um, this is something that Barbara Bartolik had helped me learn about and she guided me through a lot of this. So that's the first book is more about the alien abduction angle and how, how I discovered it through um, people who had multiple alien encounters also had a lot more interference in their lives that dealt with relationships. So the, the second book is, is an extension of having worked with many people who think they've had, quote, a love bite or a relationship that's being manipulated, or people who continue to consult with me about alien abductions and MILABs in particular. Uh, and so I define the dark side of Cupid more simply as something that has basically three characteristics. If it's a dark Cupid relationship, uh, magical, supernatural kind of precognitive elements of that partner, which is in and of itself actually very positive, you know. Um, and then the other elements were the emotional manipulation and the roller coaster and feeling like you're buffeted around this drama behind, beyond your control through these other entities or forces. And then the third aspect of the dark side of Cupid was the what I call the psychopathology manipulation factor of the psychopath personality type or somebody who's hosted by a third party entity. And then how all that plays out in the dynamics of a, a love connection and it goes from, you know, the milder cases where you just feel like it's being orchestrated and watched, you know, by these unseen forces and entities to the more dramatic cases where they're dealing with a very lethal, um, you know, psychic vampire hosted character kind of situation. And then a third of the book is really on the healing, which has to do with, you know, the awareness part, the compassionate communication skills, learning those, you know, to delve into the realm of the emotions, emotional intelligence, um, the grieving process, learning about the therapeutic process itself and the vulnerability windows of trauma. And so learning how to close the windows of vulnerability of being uh, interfered with, that was really, really important. That um, And then taking proactive measures or even paranormal intervention strategies when you, when you deal with this because more often than not, it's turning into more of a shamanic process because we're dealing with entities and attachments and forces, sometimes mind control, sometimes it's technology. So there's a lot in the book. And I actually covered some of um, Barbara Bartholik's cases from many years ago, which are just absolutely phenomenal because they, they cover classic alien UFO abduction all the way into the drama of the love obsession and um, demonic possession scenarios. And it showed the connection between all of those and those cases she was working on. So it's really more about identifying the relationship dynamics as opposed to saying it's this ET or that ET kind of thing, because I really think it's not all about extraterrestrials after all. I'm beginning to think it's much more interdimensional and um, hierarchical and deception oriented yeah. or energy vampirism oriented, obviously. Mm -hmm. So that's it in a nutshell. Awesome. Um, you Amazing, yeah. amazing stuff. And of course, we can, anybody that's interested in purchasing your books, they can get it at Amazon.com. Uh, did you also say they can get it through your website as well? Um, through the keyholepublishing.com. Okay. That's uh, Richard Dolan's website. Okay. Um, and then also you could get it through Barnes & Noble if you're in America and you want to go through Barnes & Noble, you could order it through them. Well, fantastic. Or wherever they have stores, yeah. And, and actually, I forgot to say, too, yeah. my book is coming out in Italian probably in July. Oh, wow. Uh, by a, a publisher called Uno Editore. So for those Italian-speaking people, I will have the book out. I'll be really happy about that. Very awesome. Very awesome. Well, I, I'm assuming that, in, in that, of course, you're going to be back on our show at some point. I uh, would love to do that series with you. Hopefully, we can get that done soon. And, um, you know, just as, for a final note for everyone, I just want everyone to know and be aware, of course, of these things because these are the type of things that are very difficult to talk about and just they're kept in the shadow for, for a purpose, you know. But I want everyone to understand that there are solutions and that there is hope. Isn't that true? Definitely. There's Absolutely. always hope. Always, always hope. And more hope, yes. And <laughs> the, the more of us are aware of this, the, the quicker we can bring this, uh, uh, this planet back uh, to the way it was intended originally by uh, Prime Creator. So, Eve, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's been an amazing uh, two hours, 
totally uh, enlightening. Um, and, and of course, Serena, thank you very much for being here as well. Uh, looking forward to uh, to both of you again at some point in the near future. Um, you have been listening to Shattering the Matrix on blogtalkradio.com. You can listen to us every Thursday night at 8 p.m. And more than likely, the way this is going, more than likely it will be uh, at other time slots as well. Thank you very much. This is Ari Kopel again with Shattering the Matrix. See you next week. You've been listening to Shattering the Matrix with your host, Ari Kopel and Serena. Please visit our website, 2012emergence.com. That's 2012emergence.com. Find us on Twitter at Matrix Shattered and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shattering the matrix. Listen to archived shows at blogtalkradio.com slash shattering the matrix. And join us next time for the birth of the new golden era on Shattering the Matrix.